everyone, and welcome to the committee's first meeting in 2019. We're very pleased as a committee to be in Dumfries to discuss the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. Could I please ask everyone to make sure that your mobile phones are on silent? The first item on the agenda is the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. The evidence for this Enterprise Bill will be heard from two separate witness panels tonight. The first with the local authority and related representatives, and the second with community organisations and small businesses. So moving straight on to panel one, I'd like to welcome the first uh, panel, Elaine Murray um, and Gavin Stevenson, Chief Executive of Dumfries and Galloway Council. Mark Raleigh, who's a councillor and executive member for business and economic development, and Brian McGarth, the Chief Officer for Economic Development of Scottish Borders Council, and Russell Griggs, the Chair, and Robert, Rob Dixon, the Lead Officer of the South of Scotland Economic Partnership. Now, I've had my arm twisted before the meeting um, to ask if an opening statement could be made on behalf of the panel, and I believe, Elaine Mead, you are going to do a brief opening statement. Don't touch the button, without, they'll the activate it for you. Grant, it's coming up. I can assure you as a former member of the parliament, I know how to count words and be brief. But, uh, can I say on behalf of both councils how very much we welcome the bill to establish an enterprise agency in the south of Scotland. We uh, and the South of Scotland Alliance, which both councils are part, have long campaigned for this. We believe, however, that the establishment of the new agency can transform the efforts of current partners to drive forward the eco economy of the South by connecting efforts around a regional agenda and providing structure, focus, alignment and momentum. The agency must be built in and for the South of Scotland, giving us collectively the power to address the social and economic ch challenges which bedevil our large and distinctive rural region and to maximise the potential of our considerable assets. We aren't here to ask for handouts. We are ambitious to transform the south of Scotland into one of the most vibrant rural economies in Europe, making a significant contribution to both the Scottish and UK economies. There are some matters which you might want to explore further, whether the bill should be more specific on the region's problems and potential, or whether these are better addressed in the action plan, whether there should be consultation with the board before the issuing of ministerial direction, and how local accountability is best achieved. But these are issues for the bill. We support the bill in principle. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, there are a series of questions, and just to save any confusion, um, your microphones will be activated for you. I've been at pains to stress to committee members to keep their questions as short as possible, and, and therefore short uh, answers are appreciated. Um, if you want to come in, the answer is to try and catch my eye. Uh, I won't necessarily be able to get you all in on every single question, but I'll try and make sure it's fairly distributed. I warn people uh, at the other meeting that if I waggle my pen, that means you're expending all your time. It gets more vigorous as time goes on, and I haven't yet had to launch it at anyone, but could you bear in mind that if it gets very vigorous, your time is up, and we want to get everyone through it. So the first question will be from John Mason. John, where are you? There. Thank you, convener. Yes. Uh, and I think to build maybe on what uh, Elaine Murray was saying in our introduction, she used the phrase, uh, I think, one of the most vibrant economies in Europe is what you'd like to see. So could you give us, as a kind of introduction, a feeling of where you are at the moment and what needs to happen over the next 10 to 20 years? What, what do you want to see changed uh, over the next 10 to 20 years? The main things. Elaine. OK, <laughs> right, I'll kick off on that. I think uh, the south of Scotland has tremendous potential. It has very enterprising communities uh, and has wonderful natural assets. But we haven't so far really managed to capitalise uh, as much as we could on those. And that some of the structures for economic support do not actually uh, respond to some of the challenges that we've got. So at the moment, we have problems with demographic change. We have problems with low wages. Uh, we have problems with connectivity. Uh, we need uh, assistance, I think, in overcoming those problems. If we manage to have the correct support for our economy, we believe that the potential we have in this part of the South can make a tremendous uh, contribution uh, to uh, the Scottish economy. This, this is actually about how we 
come forward and, we, and, and in us coming forward and succeeding, we help to bring success to the rest of the country. Mark, do you want to come in on that? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, you, you were asking, Mr. Mason, about change over 20 years. Um, it's going to be very tricky getting um, significant change going going quickly. So I, th I think I think it's right that we look, that we look at the long term. But in in 20 years' time, I'd like to see, um, as well as a more prosperous, more vibrant economy in the south of Scotland, I'd like to see some of the demographic trends changed, so that we aren't losing all of our young people, so that our population is growing rather than shrinking, um, and so that we're actually encouraging people to come to this part of Scotland um, to live. Um, and, of course, it's not just about the south of Scotland. The south of Scotland needs to be playing its part in the Scottish economy, um, and I'd like to see us being significantly greater contributors to that in the next 10 and 20 years. Just for a minute, um, you both talked about democratic uh, challenges. Now, everywhere I've heard of faces democratic demographic challenges, you know, from Germany and everywhere else. What, what is different about the south of Scotland? Do you face extra challenges uh, that other places don't? The problem is more severe in the south of Scotland than it is in, in the rest of the country. Now, our, our young people leave to go to university. They tend not to come back again, and we don't replace them with other young people. And, I mean, ageing population is, again, a common problem. It's not a problem. I don't know whether I'm saying an ageing population is a problem. <laughs> okay. But there are a lot of, because it is a beautiful rural area, there are quite a lot of people who like to come to retire in the south of Scotland. We're not as expensive as the Lake District, the Yorkshire Dales, so quite, we're, we're often quite popular for people coming in. That brings a lot of potential with it, but obviously there are issues as well as people get older if we don't have the economy to sustain them. I'd like to bring Russell in, if I may, and then I'll go to Mark, and then Stuart's got a supplementary. Russell, do you want to... Yeah. I guess, in answer to what our vision is, we spoke last year as we went around looking at, <coughs> excuse me, about what the new agency should do to about 600 local people and what they saw the future for the south of Scotland. And I think one of the challenges they have is how they're viewed from elsewhere in Scotland, as seen, perhaps, as you said, as being um, with lots of challenges that put right, whereas a lot of the people in the south of Scotland think there are already a lot of strengths here that we can build on. And it was interesting listening to a lot of the comments that were made at the session before this by those in the audience, that you know, if we start to mesh our social side together with our farming and our forestry, our tourism and our food and drink and everything else that we have, we have a really strong foundation to build an economy on over the next 20 years. And I guess the thing we've been missing over the last um, years in doing this is a different type of connectivity is to see how all those different type parts of our economy work together. And how, for example, the farmers support the local shops and the, the local tourism, the, the community and the crafts part of um, the south of Scotland now is at the hub of all we do. So in many ways, it's the, it's the force from the bottom that's going to drive our economy rather than something from the top. And it was quite interesting in listening to it as we went <coughs> round. There was... No real negativity. So the people of the south of Scotland feel there's a huge opportunity here if we can all coalesce into one, one economy that all talks in the same way. So while we do have all those challenges and nobody's denying it, we shouldn't also forget that we have an awful lot of opportunities, some great industries and some great people and some great communities. And with the communities coming into this, I think there's a, a huge future. So our vision for the next 20 years is to take that energy that exists out there within the people of the south of Scotland that want to build on that and turn it into something that they will create um, over the next 20 years. Mark, do you want to come in and, and then Stuart? Thank you. It, it was just on that, that demographic point. Certainly everywhere does have challenges, but here they are very specific in that you do have um, a shrinking, po shrinking population in part, parts of the south and a huge imbalance between, between young and old. And the projections are in, are in the submissions already about um, what proportion of people we're expecting to be over, over 75. But, but that, that, that mix has to change. And, and the young gentleman in, in the earlier session today 
um, made, made the case very eloquently that we do need to think about becoming more focused on um, a younger um, economy, um, a, a, a younger society. And part of that is going to be making our towns more vibrant. Part of that is going to be addressing the connectivity um, issues, which is, which is not just about the number of roads we've got, but the number of buses that are on them. Um, and there is a huge job of work to do, which I think the agency could be incredibly helpful with. Stuart, you wanted to ask a question? Um, brief question that probably has a brief answer. Um, Elaine Murray said uh, aiming to be the best in Europe. Um, is there an idea of what part of Europe that might be comparable in its problems and profiles that is actually doing well? And, and what structurally, because we're looking at a structural change here, uh, are they doing that might guide us as to how to help the South of Scotland most effectively? I think that's actually something the agency would be looking at. I don't know if I can actually answer that for you just off the top of my head, but I would actually see that as one of the things that the agency might be able to do, which would be look for, look for examples of good practice elsewhere and see how they can be adapted to the south of Scotland. I actually think that uh, the productivity challenge that we face uh, is, is the flip side of... The, the really strong locations in, in Europe and, and actually we, we need to have a focus on entrepreneurship, uh, the agency needs to drive forward innovation and, and innovation in its broadest sense about business improvement, not just that new product devel development that many people talk about in terms of innovation and I think that, that that's what can pull, pull the economy forward and, um, and encourage a, a, a more diverse range of businesses in the area and, and more larger growing businesses. Okay, John. Yes. <coughs> uh, the other area I wanted to move on to and which uh, Russell Griggs kind of touched on was uh, from the grassroots up and business startup because obviously the, this new enterprise board is going to focus quite a lot on businesses and so on. Um, is the main issue to try and get more businesses started in the area because I think that has perhaps been lower than the rest of Scotland or is it to grow existing businesses or is it to bring in big businesses? Gav, Gav, hold on, sorry. Gavin wants to come in and then I'll, br I'll bring bring you in. Sorry, it's very difficult and I apologise if I, if I I'm trying to steer a very tight line that everyone gets a chance so I apologise if I don't get it right but Gavin first and then Russell. I think this is a fundamental opportunity. I think the answer is yes to all three but I would say that wouldn't I? I think that the problem we've, we've had in the past is access and reach and the availability of the markets. I think that across a, a geography of many many small communities who weren't actually economic drivers it's been really difficult for business startups and many of our businesses with more businesses per head than elsewhere in Scotland, they don't normally come through the public sector. So therefore I think it's about how you count them. But even then, the, the traditional sectors down here are very traditional. They've long established supply chains. So therefore there's not, an, there's not the, in a low wage economy the ability to start up new businesses because actually without digital, which is now coming, access to markets, as you, particularly as you moved further west, almost became impossible. So actually, I think we became almost a self-fulfilling prophecy around the businesses. Actually, it was almost dumbing down over a period of years. I think the opportunity we now have is by recognising that we want the agency to be everywhere, in every community, with all the partners present, that actually we'll be where these young entrepreneurs and people are. The digital R100 rollout will actually be able to connect our businesses, our creative industries, new industries, why wouldn't you want to live in a beautiful place like this if your market was, say, Scandinavia? And I think it's connecting that almost like the moon's aligning at the one time is what the agency can do. It brings significant capacity. I mean, the councils have done what the councils have done, but our teams doing business startup are only, you know, less than a handful of people. If we had everybody working in every community, bringing as one large connected partnership team, that's when we'll start to pick people from school through and attract entrepreneurs to come and live here. Why wouldn't Tesla want to build it in the, I mean, the green lungs of, of the bit between the central belt and the northern powerhouse? That's where we sit. Why wouldn't you, if you're a green company, want to locate here if we can provide the skills and the technology? And that's what the enterprise company can bring together for me. Russell. I guess one of the things that we will stop doing is talking about businesses and talk about growing enterprises. And whether that enterprise is a community, whether it's a social enterprise, whether it's a small business or a large business, doesn't really matter. 
And I think that's the culture, the change that we want to see through the Enterprise Agency in the south of Scotland, which is to understand that we give support to everybody that wants to grow and help grow the economy. And if you look across our patch, there are as many growing communities as there are growing businesses. And those communities are a mix of small micro-businesses, of community enterprises, of all sorts of things. <coughs> Excuse me. And that means that we'll have to have a very different type of support system that works with those, similar to the, the, the one that they have in the Highlands and Islands. And we've been up to look at that, and there's some really good examples that you can take for that. But it's a recognition that an economy like ours doesn't just rely on businesses, because a lot of the thought and the growth and et cetera comes from across the whole of the communities and not recognising a community in itself as a business or something that you can grow is a real detriment to what we would do if we didn't do it properly. So, yes, we'll do all those, but in many ways, we have to stop thinking the economic development's about businesses only. It's about a whole raft of other things that you need to grow at the same time. Jamie, you want to come in briefly? Uh, thank you, and uh, good evening to our panel members. Um, part of the criticism that we've had, though, around the reasons that why uh, people leave the area are some of these issues around things like local housing supplies, local connectivity and transport, uh, etc. This new agency will not be the great panacea of these problems. These are, many of these things are things that are already under the control of local authorities. What makes you think that the agency will be able to tackle things that perhaps you've been criticised of not been able to tackle? Um, I'm going to give Mark and Elaine the opportunity to answer that. Uh, Mark, do you want to go first? Or? If you can it. <laughs> um, um, I, I, I suppose the, 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 the essence of the agency is going to be scale. Um, it's, it's going to be significantly larger than um, just a small local authority um, acting by itself with its, um, with its relatively restricted budgets. But it's also about what's been happening with SOSEP over the past year, that it's been aligning all of the other agencies. And I know um, in the session you had this afternoon and in, in previous sessions there have been questions about why isn't X agency doing more, why, why isn't Y agency doing, doing, doing more in the area. All of those agencies like Visit Scotland and Scottish Enterprise and SDS um, will still um, exist and will still operate across the south of Scotland. But the, the new enterprise agency brings an opportunity to drive those forward and to align, align them and, and effectively to call them to account in a, in, a, in a way that local authorities sometimes struggle to do. And I think it's that additional um, heft that the agency is going to put to their work right across the south that, it, that is going to make the big difference and start driving some significant and not noticeable change. Elaine. I agree with Mark that it's actually about alignment because there are a lot of different agencies working already in the south of Scotland. This is an additional one, but the south of Scotland Enterprise Agency needs to be that final part of the jigsaw. In order to work successfully, though, I think it will be important that everybody knows what everybody else contributes and what everybody else needs to do. And I think probably some consideration has to be given as to how, how that is done in practice, because otherwise you, can, you could get you know, councils doing, doing the same thing as the agency and not working together properly. So actually the structure is going to be quite important when it comes into play. Joan, you, you've got a brief question, I think. Very briefly, thank you very much, convener, and thank you for, for having me at your committee today. It was for Professor uh, Griggs, and who made the comparison with Highlands and Islands Enterprise. I wonder if you could just confirm on the record that the agency will have the same per capita funding as Highlands and Islands Enterprise, because obviously that's been very, very successful in that particular region of Scotland. Uh, my, my understanding is I can be very short on that, is that's what it says within, I think, the financial memorandum to the bill, so yeah. that would be the case. Okay. Um, Colin, do you want to come in on that? I was interested in um, the fact that obviously the, the, the new agency will exist alongside Scottish Enterprise, will still be there. Skills Development Scotland will still be there. Dumfries and Galloway Council will still be there. But the bill is currently silent on what mechanism would be put in place to make sure there isn't duplication, or probably more significantly, there are still not gaps, because that's the biggest criticism at the moment. There are gaps in the support to, 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 to enterprises in the region. So. Do you have any views on what mechanisms could be put in place within the bill to make sure that, that all the agencies are working together? And in the point that I made, Elaine, that everybody knows what each other is doing. 
volunteer an idea. Um, it, it could be through a, some sort of a memorandum of understanding between the different par partners in term, terms of you know what we all bring to the table and what we expect to uh, each other to contribute. I, you know, I think it's probably quite important. It's just maybe something you would, the committee wants to discuss with the cabinet secretary. But uh, I think you do have, need to have something that ensures that it works as effectively as possible. Okay. I mean. Uh, some of it will be to, surely to do with the dynamics of the person that's leading it as well. Would you, would, Russell? Yeah. Yes, Colin, a part of it is already in place, <clears throat> in that we, and it's kind of like the bill. What we're trying to do is give ourselves room to move as we grow. So where we've got to with, for example, Scottish Enterprise at the moment, is the agreement is that <clears throat> the new agency will have the same relationship on day one as High currently has with Highlands and Islands Enterprise. So on things like the um, manufacturing advisory serv service, overseas trade, etc., the stuff that's done at a national level, that will carry on. But like High, all the local services, etc., will be done by the local agency. Now, the reason we've said at the beginning is as the agency develops, it may well develop some skill sets that are then useful to the rest of Scotland. And one of the things we want to see, I guess, as we grow these three economic development agencies across Scotland is a better sharing of expertise between the, the same, so we don't need an expert in every one for some of the things we do, which will get around the duplication. But on day one, the agreement is between the, ourselves and the new and Highlands, sorry, and Scottish Enterprise, is the relationship will be exactly the same as they have with Highlands and Islands on day one, which is the national programmes stay where they are, including the ones with the Highlands and Islands, and we take over the local, and the, sorry, the new agency takes over the local services. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next uh, set of questions, which, uh, Mike, you're leading on, Mike. Thank you, convener. Since um, Jamie has kindly um, asked my question number four, I'll go straight on to my other question, which is question number five. <laughs> and um, why do you think that the new agency should just cover your two council areas and not South Ayrshire and South Lanarkshire, who have the same problems, I would imagine, as the um, Dumfries and Galloway and, and the Borders councils? So, I don't know who wants to go first there, but hopefully the uh, fighting on the committee is not going to extend to be the fighting between the, the two councils. Who would like to go first? Uh, uh, Gavin, would you like to head off on that? I would say that... Um, if you look at the uh, GV and low, look, the police in Galloway, I mean, sitting now at the bottom of the wage uh, list of 32 councils, you know, even with Western Isles now above, I think we need to move at pace. We've proven, working together through the Alliance, that we've long developed um, working relationships. We know each other, we trust each other. We've got the shared aims, regardless of the political colour of the councils. We've come together around uh, a shared objective. And I think that would help us to move at pace. I think that the nature of our economy, we're different. I mean, we, are, we have a different makeup of our economy. We don't have the dominance of, of, of a large urban centre to draw on. But the other thing is that what we design here would allow us to move at pace, but it doesn't mean that where we see the opportunity across a border for Castellan to Mellington, that that wouldn't be stretched. That's key to the way we're working now in the partnership. But for me, we need the agency to move and move quickly. Otherwise, we'll get out of t out, not be able to recover. And I actually think that the working relationships will develop and the way we're now working with the multi-agencies through the, the partnership uh, under Russell proves that we can work together at this level. I think that moving it beyond that would start to dilute the ability for it to move at pace. But it doesn't mean on the edges are moving into the rural, deep rural area of air that the opportunities of projects would not extend. They do currently. Uh, uh, Brian, do you want to say anything or do you agree totally? Um, with, with Gavin, um, but the south of Scotland, if you take the two local authorities, is a very distinct and understandable proposition. I think as soon as you start taking in parts of other local authorities, it, it, it becomes confused. Uh, John, you had, a, I think, a, a follow-up on that. Uh, uh, good evening, panel. It, it was for Professor Griggs, or indeed um, Mr Dixon, and it was about your submission. Um, uh, and when I read it, I wrote, where is the south of Scotland um, across the top of your key messages? Because at number nine, you say, and I quote here, the suggested geographic area for the new agency is correct, but the new agency must be everywhere in the south. Is that 
Can you maybe expand on that, please? Because Highlands and Islands Enterprises, uh, and before at the HIDB, was, is, is often cited. Of course, there already are historic and very clear, the Crofton County's analogy there. What, what's meant by that, Mr. Dixon, then, please? Rob, I think you want to answer that, do you? Uh, yeah, so the, 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 the basis, as Mark and Gavin have already said, of bringing borders, Scottish Borders Council area and Dumfries and Galloway Council area together is one that's been a consistent partnership over quite a long period of time, 10 years or more, um, through the South of Scotland Alliance. And we definitely believe that the proposition as framed in the bill that it should be these two, these two council areas is correct. And it's correct because of the unique nature um, of this geographic area. The rurality is greater in those two council areas than if you extend into the South Ayrshire or South Lanarkshire or more of the Ayrshire. Even at a measure of population density, the changes are quite stark as soon as you go into those other areas. That's not to say that they don't have their challenges. They absolutely do. But I think we're clear that those two council areas have similar challenges, a similar base of operating, similar position in terms of economic potential and economic challenge at present. And that's why it makes good sense to bring those two together, both for the partnership as is at the moment, but also for um, the agency as it's formed. If I, if I may, convene that. Um, and no matter where you're drawing a line in a map, people will have comments to make. But you, just to continue the devil's advocacy, people in Peebles, for instance, might have a clearer identity with the Edinburgh area than necessarily with Stranraer. And similarly, um, people in uh, South Ayrshire and South Lanarkshire more readily might identify with them, Fries and Galloway. What latitude would you see around this issue? Uh, let me try and answer that, because we actually went to Peebles and spoke to people of Peebles about that. And I, I guess all you could say is you're right, and, and they're right as well, that they say they do associate themselves with the borders. I think across the whole of the south of Scotland, a lot of people think they're different, but as we've gone around and spoken to them, there's a lot of key issues that go across everybody. Um, and I think the people of Peebles, um, yes, do see themselves as drawn to Edinburgh, but also see them as a key part of the... Of the, of the tourism offer to the south of Scotland. And indeed, if you look down towards there, down to Gala, and what has happened through cycling, which they now see as the key tourism driver for the whole of that economy, that is very much driven by the south of Scotland and not Edinburgh. And I guess one of the challenges about anything you do in an area like ours is understanding what are the key drivers in each community. Because this has to be, I go back to what I said earlier about communities leading what we do and not from somebody at time trying to make a decision for all the communities, which might well be different in its, in its detail, but there will be similar issues across them all. Emma, you wanted to, to come in briefly and then I'm going to get, come to Peter Chapman. Thank you. Thank you, convener, and thanks, everybody. Dumfries happens to be the town where I live, so I welcome everybody that's here tonight, and it's actually great that the committee's coming here. But Gavin mentioned um, political colours, um, and we've got a Borders Council, we've got Dumfries and Galloway Council. I'm interested in, when we're exploring long-term plans or key aims, priorities and goals, how do we make sure that the colours of the politics don't interfere with long-term goals, that goals can be established and then that plan can be stuck to as far as what is the greater good for the whole of the south of Scotland, even though we've got two local authority regions and, and then all of the history behind years of you know, election cycles and things like that. Kevin, is, is that something that you should answer or, or, or should a councillor be answering that? Um, <laughs> So you don't get put in a difficult position? Oh, I'm always in a difficult position, convener. Um, <laughs> I, would, I would like to start it and, and then add to the politics. I think the answer is almost like a previous question. It's we need to align the planning processes. I don't think anyone of any political colour don't want the same outcomes that don't define success in the same way as having high-skilled jobs, retaining a young people, giving opportunity and choice. And I think if we keep to those strategic aims, how we get there will always be a matter of political debate. But I think the criticality for the agency is to have a plan in which other plans feed into in the same language. I think too often, particularly in the south of Scotland, the language has got in the way. We talk about the same thing in different ways. And I think if it's more about setting those high-level strategic outcomes of what success will look like in 10 or 20 years, and, and aligning the planning processes, making sure all the plans take account of each other, because there will be a statute, the agency, I believe, would be a statutory community planning partner. 
Therefore, we use that mechanism to make sure everybody focuses on those key high-level aims. And for me, I've never met a politician who doesn't want children to have opportunity or, or elderly to be well-fed and good high-paid jobs for their area. And I think if we get the planning at that level right, then there'll always be the politics lower down. We're excluding politicians and moving straight to Brian. <laughs> I want to look backwards in this instance as well because I, I think actually the south of Scotland through, through the south of Scotland alliance has demonstrated a, a, a really strong cross-party shared view of, of, of where it wants to get to. Uh, the, the south of Scotland alliance is uh, a rotating chairmanship each year between the two councils, different parties represented around the table and, and has worked very effectively. So I think that, that demonstrates that that, that shared vision across across the different political spectrum. Mark, you want to come in? It, it, it's an interesting question because I, I, I've never seen this in terms of, of, of party politics and actually it's the first discussion I can remember having that included party, party politics in it. Um, Elaine and I are of slightly different hue um, but I can say from the Scottish Borders Council perspective, my predecessor in this role, who again was, a, was, 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 was from another party, if he was sat here, he would be equally enthusiastic about what we're asking for the south of Scotland. Um, and I, I don't see that, that small-scale party politics come, come into it at all. And Elaine, for, for balance. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think that... Um, the establishment of the agency might mean, in fact, that the economic strategy is less at the vagaries of the electoral cycle because it's actually a, an independent agency and it's not uh, local councils uh, determining that. That said, I have to agree with the others. And you know, the establishment of a South and Scotland enterprise agency has been, I think, in the manifestos of all the political parties, certainly in, in, in the South of Scotland, we've all campaigned for it. Um, so I don't... and. Uh, certainly my experience in the Parliament, members of different parties were prepared to work together when it was for the benefit of the South of Scotland. I think all politicians across the South of Scotland tend to put the South of Scotland first, and when necessary, they, they, they put their political allegiance aside in order to uh, further the, the uh, interests of the South of Scotland. And the next interesting question then is going to come from Peter Chapman. Peter. Thank you, convener, and good evening, panel. Um, I'm interested in the practicalities of the setup of the new agency and, 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 and I'm going to ask some questions about offices and we want the new agency to be accessible so there's a feeling there should be more than one office, certainly, but if there is a headquarters needed for legal purposes, where should that HQ be considering that unlike HIE there is no natural capital of the south? Um, Elaine, you can go first, followed by Mark. I would see the headquarters as a nominal headquarters because it's required for legal purposes. And therefore, it doesn't really matter where that is. What does matter is that the agency works right across the south of Scotland and it co-locates in offices, whether it's with the public sector, the private sector, with social enterprises, whether, wherever is most appropriate in that community. It works right throughout the, 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 the south of Scotland rather than from a, a spanking new headquarters, either in Dumfries or Peebles or wherever. Minister will make, will make that decision on where, where the nominal headquarters will, will be, but rather than seeing one big shiny brass plaque and a reception desk um, somewhere in the south of Scotland, I, I want to see plaques right across the south of Scotland that say South of Scotland Enterprise is here, is here, is here. It needs to be absolutely embedded into communities right the way across the south of, the south of Scotland. Um, and it might only go to a tiny little community on a Tuesday afternoon or when it's got, a, got, got appointments, but the, the really vital thing is that it gets absolutely out, out there. And the, the members have already drawn our attention to the challenges of the scale and the extent and the rurality and, and the difference in our communities. That's why um, South of Scotland Enterprise needs to be in all of those places right the way across the South. Uh, briefly, Russell, I'll come to you and then back to Peter. The um, headquarters is just a mailing address, really. I mean, th th we, we didn't use everywhere lightly. We strongly believe that wherever people need to access this new South of Scotland Enterprise Agency, they have to have a means to do that locally. 
And therefore, that means, going back to the point that Jamie made earlier in the earlier session about how we use our resource, we see a lot of our resource going on co-locating with community organisations, with social enterprises, with businesses. So we'll have hot desks everywhere. And therefore, that allows us to use our resource funding actually to provide an economic driver by providing extra income to those, to those um, places. So, yes, of course, we'll have a place where, where all the mail goes to. But it's really important that everybody in the south of Scotland believes that locally they can go and access that. And that will be the um, resource plan in terms of our infrastructure or somebody else called it the other day our tube map of what happens across the south of Scotland. Peter. I have a lot of sympathy with that, with that idea that co-location is, is one way to do it. Uh, you know, if you want as many offices as you possibly can in a cost-effective way, then probably co-location is the only option. How, how do you see that, the new agency, developing its own identity if, if it is co-located in, in, you know, in, in all cases right across the south? It, it, will it lose its own identity somewhat if it's, if it's always located with other, other organisations? Or how do you, f do you feel that's, that's a, a, a possible danger? Uh, Rob, Rob, you were nodding your head. <clears throat> um, I think it's a challenge. Um, but I think, as you've heard already in the way that the questions have been answered and you heard this afternoon, the agency, the agency is keenly anticipated um, Chair, when you asked for a show of hands, I, I was sitting at the back, but I think it was uh, unanimous, might be uh, exaggerating slightly, but a one against them, so <laughs> not quite unanimous. So I think um, the territory is fertile for the agency to establish itself, and the people in the South want the agency to be established. Of course, as a new organisation, it needs to do an excellent professional job in raising awareness, in having an identity, and making that identity strong, but I genuinely believe the existing public sector players want that to happen. They see that as helpful. Businesses want it to happen and communities want it to happen. As we went around the south to 26 events, that is what we were told unequivocally in every location. Okay. Perfect. Uh, well, then we'll move on to the next question, which I think is Stuart. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you uh, very much indeed, uh, convener. Uh, looking at the terms of the bill that's before us, uh, there are four aims at uh, uh, Section 5, uh, which are economic and social development, amenity and environment. And then it goes on in paragraph 2 of that section uh, to list a, quite a long list of, of things. And I want to just focus on one or two of them. Uh, business startups, entrepreneurship and enhancing skills are among the things that it says are included in what... Uh, South Scotland uh, Enterprise would do. But these are clearly ones that are the responsibility of other bodies and may remain so. Um, we heard from Russell Griggs and I think Elaine Murray memorandum of understanding, but given the granularity of these different things, are there particular challenges as to how we, we make these cross-cutting things that are clearly on the list of South Scotland, but they're also on other people's lists? or should we simply eliminate them from other people's lists? Mm. Who would like to get your... But, but I should have said at the beginning that if you all look the other way, when a difficult question is asked, so I will end up nominating somebody. So on the basis that you did all look the other way, uh, Mark, how about you start that one off? No, I don't think we should... Um, take responsibility for various things off of other agencies' lists. Um, but I think it's very much uh, for the work of, of the board when they get established and for the work plan to define who is doing what, um, who's pushing which projects and whatever. And I, I, I think Russell and Rob would be better at answering um, uh, this than, than I am, but the indications are from, from the South of Scotland Partnership um, which is, is, is the kind of the, the interim kind of leading, leading into this is that that as an organisation has been successful at bringing the national organisations to the table and asking them to do some, some heavy lifting and also coordinating with local authorities as well. So Rob, before I bring you in, Gavin sort of half offered to answer that. So Gavin. I thought Rob would jump in first. Um, <laughs> I, I think that if we, if we shove everything in the one basket, we could create another beast that, that by very nature of public bodies grows itself. 
And in fact, what we're wanting is something that's very focused. And I think it proved in the last year, working um, um, with um, Russell and, and Rob, is that actually, you know, responsibility can stay where it is, but single accountability. And we all feel singly accountable within the partnership. And I think for me, it's proved we can work together if actually we have a framework to work together. And what the, the partnership arrangements have given us that framework that, of, and building up that trust between bodies. And I think we need to split that, you know, let's not create another beast that could, that life of its own. Actually, let's get it like a, a scalpel, but actually with an underlying joint accountability from all the partners. And I think it's the framing of that in the planning process and accountability processes. We want to be accountable for the economy of the South as a partnership. And, and then we view the enterprise agency as, as an essential gap that we have at the moment. Can I just be absolutely clear? You said responsibility and accountability. Where are you saying to the committee that you are looking for other agencies with whom this new body will have to work, having a formal accountability to the new enterprise agency? Or were you trying to say something slightly different? No, I think, I think you're, you're singly accountable for everybody agreeing the one plan we create. Like Skills Development Scotland are preparing a South of Scotland skills plan. I think it's making sure that everybody that commits to that plan is accountable for it. And actually, it's not us being accountable to enterprise agency. As a partner under community planning, we should all be accountable to each other as a partnership. And I think what we've been testing in the last 12 months is the ability of the partnership to stand those tensions. Yeah. I, I really do want to bottom this out. Are we suggesting that if it's Skills Development Scotland who have developed something, possibly at the behest of the new agency, that they should be reporting and appearing and accounting directly to the new body? Now, because shared accountability is no accountability. I, I do forgive me with my business experience, that's the way I kind of look at things. I think maybe not to create um, a governance beast as well, but I think it's quite right. If you've agreed to deliver something as part of a plan as a partnership, I would expect you to expect to be called before if you fail to deliver. The supplementary, but Rob, I bring you in briefly. Okay. You might get another bite when John's asked his question. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think um, Gavin's put his finger on, on what the essence of the issue here is. We're being asked, and the partnership as a temporary arrangement has been asked um, to have a new model, a new approach. Um, and at an official level, I'm charged with bringing together and coordinating the work of the seven public sector agencies. It is a partnership. It's, it's what our title is. It's just a partnership at present. I have to say the willingness of the partners to sit around the table and contribute their resources in new and different ways has been probably one of the most exciting things that the partnership's been able to achieve in the last year. So whether it's about, um, as you heard from Michael Cross, a new assistant director for the Scottish Funding Council, um, or whether it's about uh, the additional money that Visit Scotland have been able to invest in the South, or whether it's about um, the SDS Regional Skills Investment Plan, or the 6.6 .6 million we've invested with the colleges. These are all new initiatives that the new model has enabled but the focus on the delivery has been brought about by the presence of the partnership. The organization responsible for the delivery of each element remains the best placed agency to do it. And I think, um, as Stuart Stevenson was driving at, that's where the accountability needs to sit with that agency, positioned quite clearly as delivering something in the South to which it should be accountable to the South agency in time. This has sparked a whole lot of supplementary questions. So I'm gonna go John Finney first, and then Finley, and, and then Joan. So, John, Th thank you, like. Convener. And, and it was with regard to the, the, the question about duplication. What, the, the one aspect that would mark out the proposal different uh, to, to what the present situation is the social remit. Now, I apologise for re repeating what to some people what would have heard earlier. And uh, paragraph 5.2 sets out six actions. Five of these relate to economic and social development. Only one uh, relates to social development and that's narrow and relates to supporting community organizations to help meet their community needs. To me, that's key, and I wonder if there's an opportunity to, to look at things different. One of our contributors in the previous session talked about new economic indicators and well-being. Is there an opportunity to think, yes, of course we want jobs and force, can we take the focus away from the balance sheet and perhaps concentrate on some of these fairly um, 
intrinsic things that would make a community a good place. Okay, Russell, would you like to come in on that? I guess I heard the discussion earlier on, and I, I guess I don't agree that it's only one that's there, because that assumes that it's only business that can do the, fa the ones that we previewed before, and I don't believe that. I believe that communities and social enterprises and all sorts of things can be involved in A, B, C, D, and E. So I think there's a spread. It's because we have this fixation that only businesses can deliver those things, and I don't agree with that. I think communities... And, so to me, the bill's fine, as long as you put the context on it, that what we're talking about here is getting everybody to contribute towards economic development in the south of Scotland and not just businesses. ...from evidence we've received, but I wonder if you'd like to comment on Professor Griggs on the opportunity to view things differently. I mean, people talk about the Humankind Index, for instance, well-being, factors like that. They don't readily show up in a balance sheet, but they are very important. They are indeed. And uh, one of the things we were asked to do when we were asked to create this new agency and then through the partnership is to be creative and innovative and to have a look at what was there uh, currently and whether we want to change that. And I think we'll do a lot of that. So, for example, in terms of supporting inclusive economic growth, we'll, we're already in the, just about to come finishing a big piece of work we've done in the south of Scotland to say, what does that look like for the south of Scotland, which I'm happily to come back and share with the committee. So we've got, um, from Gary Gillespie's economics team, who has pulled up all the stuff on inclusive growth, we've had people talking to businesses, people talking to communities, to look what an inclusive growth model would look like for an area like the south of Scotland. So we are trying to be innovative and see what that will change in the way some of the bodies work and the way we have to do things. If we're going to now speak to farmers, foresters, small rural retail, and bring them into the way that we support businesses in the south of Scotland and communities, how do we do that and what, does, what differences does that mean we have to make and change the rule book that does that? Growth, presumably. Um, well, growth is a really interesting word. If every business in the south of Scotland grew by 2.5%, we wouldn't be sitting having this discussion. So it's not just about... If communities grew, we wouldn't necessarily be having this Absolutely discussion. Absolutely correct. Too. So, it, it, so I'm contradicting myself. <laughs> so if communities grew... Yeah, if you got, so it, growth is a really interesting word, and the trouble is that growth get hooked up with businesses that want to grow at huge rates. That's not what growth is about. If you look at my own little art centre in Sanka that's grown from an art centre to re-establishing Sanka knitting throughout the world, which has spun off another two businesses... In our little community, that's huge growth. And that's the, thing, the type of thing that we have to support. So it's about just understanding that growth is just not about growing big companies. I think, I think we've taken that one as far as we can, John, in the, in the time. Finney, you, you, you'd like a quick question? Thanks, Convener. Just, just going back to something that Rob said about um, all the different agencies coming together to deliver. Now, would that plan be put together by the agency, which then, of course, would be approved by the Scottish Government, would, would those agencies be held to account um, on that plan or, or the, the aspirations that the board had? And, or, or would they just be expected to deliver on the plan? So who ultimately would uh, make the plan? I presume that's the agency which would then be approved. But would the Visit Scotland or SDS or SNH have to deliver to the aspirations of that plan? Rob. Uh, we are going to come on to plans in, in some greater detail, so, uh, because I think, I think this is a wider question. So, I mean, if you'd like to answer it briefly, and then um, I'm very happy uh, to, to part the accountability of plans to slightly later on. I think I can answer it in one word, which is yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Perfect. Well, that's, you know, that, doesn't, that never happens on this committee, that somebody keeps an answer to one word. So let's try and see if we can keep a short question from Joan uh, to Thank follow it up. Thank you. Thank you very much again, uh, convener. Yes, yeah, so it, again, it was going back to Stuart Stevenson's original question about uh, these different agencies and partnerships. Um, creative industries is something that's come up in a lot of the submissions, and I know it's a priority for a lot of stakeholders uh, in the, this region. Uh, my other hat is as convener of the Culture Committee, and I know uh, the potential of the creative industry's enormous potential to create jobs, um, but also we know that there are tensions with the way the creative industries are dealt with by different agencies at the moment. They fall between Scottish Enterprise and Creative Scotland, and I just wondered if, uh, if um, Professor Griggs was aware of 
those existing tensions and how they are going to be uh, addressed when the responsibility passes to the new agency? Aware of them, and yes, it will be dealt with when it's passed to the new agency. Trying to keep that answer brief. Okay, so that's all under control. It's all dealt with. Um, on that note, uh, Stuart, I think you've got a follow-up question. Um, yes, I'll, I'll make this my last bit from this section, uh, uh, convener. Um, we've talked about what is in the bill, what the the, um, the new body is going to do, uh, but one of the inputs we've had from Newcastle to the District Community Trust, although I suspect others might say this too, is that what the bill doesn't cover, in particular the identifying infrastructure decisions uh, such as transport and connectivity. Given that those uh, are things which will be important to making this a successful innovation, what relationship to decision making on these subjects, and perhaps one or two others, should this board and the South of Scotland have? Mark and Elaine, I think those are sort of questions in your area. Elaine, do you want to start that off? Yeah. Uh, uh, the, um, it, it's a difficult point, isn't it, as what should mm. be in the bill, on the face of the bill, and what should be in the action plan. I think that's what the tension is, because we could put other things on the face of the bill. Could, other things, I think, which are important, like reversing the demographic change, we've spoken about that, about improving connectivity, about promoting cultural and natural heritage, they could all be on can the face I, of can the I bill just, too. Can I just help a little bit by saying, I'm, I'm simply looking at um, the list that is provided in the bill, which is, it's a list, um, da da da, includes, and then it gives a list, and these are not on that list. And I suppose mm. my question is, should they be? I think there's an argument that they, they could be on that list, and I think that's probably a discussion that the committee probably would want to have with the Cabinet Secretary as to where exactly those sit, because I say I think that some of these things are, are very important to, to the success of the agency. Can I also say, actually, about the, your earlier question about accountability, I think there's also a very important issue about okay, the, the new agency is accountable to ministers, but I don't see on the face of the bill where it is accountable to the people of the south of Scotland, and I think that actually merits some discussion as well. And, Elaine, I guarantee we're going to come on to that. Uh, 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 Mark? In, in, term, in terms of things, topic, topics like um, connectivity and digital connectivity, I, I would kind of hope that they would drop off the work plan in a few short years, that, 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 they, that they will be tasks that, that have been sorted out. Now, there, there is no bigger critic of rural broadband um, in, in my part of the world than, than I, but I think it's important that the bill itself is high level and enabling and looks forward to a time in 10, 20 or, thir or 30 years time and still looks relevant. And I think those, those topics are very much for the board to tackle through, through the work plan. I, I think everyone's hoping that connectivity and broadband will be fixed very shortly and Richard yours is the next question. Can I say, um, it's clear that the panel clearly has very high expectations for the new agency. But can I remind you, the council, or no council, should be or will be running it. This agency, how should this be agency be managed considering positive outcomes may take years to achieve? Who'd like to lead off on that? Um, hey, see, so you're all doing it again. You're all looking away. Uh, um, uh, I'm Hello. not sure I totally understand the question, to be honest, when you say no council will be managing the agency. Certainly, I wouldn't have any aspiration that the agency would somehow be managed by local authorities. The local authorities well, will work for, with Elaine, the Elaine, agency. For the, time, for the time that I've known you, I'm sitting here basically getting the feeling that the council wants to get their fingers into it. But anyway, that, that aside, who should be running or managing and what's taking on board that there won't be... Um, Basically, there won't be positive outcomes for many years to achieve. Uh, Mark, do you want to...? I, 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 I disagree. Um, I, th I think there will be positive outcomes um, coming, coming very quickly. I th uh, but all of our benefits are not just going to be short-term ones. Um, I mean, SOSEP announced um, in partnership with Scottish Borders Council this week 
uh, that we're opening a textile centre of excellence in, in Hoik. Now that will start doing its work in a few weeks time. So that will be delivering good before the agency is, 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 is even up and running. But a, a lot of the big structural changes and the, those, those, those region-wide demographic and um, economic challenges are going to take, take a long time. And, and the simple question of who, who is there to run it um, the agency is, 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 there, is there to run it once ministers have established it, and that's why it's important that there is an incredibly good and rigorously chosen um, board who are, who are holding the officers of, of that agency to account. Um, I initially thought that the councils um, should be on the board. Um, I, don't think they, I don't think they should. Um, because I think the board has to has to run this, and I think the councils have to become very good and critical friends of the enterprise agency when it's when it's established. And I think we probably have a much louder voice if we're directing our comments to the um, agency from outside, rather than having to rather sit on our council hands if we were if we were to be sat on on the board itself and as comments were made earlier this afternoon you know that board has to be packed with exactly the right skills and I suspect sticking a couple of councillors on it um, is not going to come high um, high up, up the list but our, our submission does make clear how we want to see local accountability through um, an expanded south of Scotland alliance which is heading towards the highlands and islands accountability model. Richard, Richard, just sorry, before we go on to your next question, Russ would like to come in on that. So, R R would you like to come in yeah, briefly, it's, it's, Russ? It's very quickly to say, um, I think whoever manages, who should manage the new agency in the end is the people of the south of Scotland. While, while there is a, a governing body there that runs it on a day-to-day -day basis, and therefore it's no coincidence that the first large amount of money that we spent in, in the economic partnership, which will go through into the new agency, was this money on, on getting more young people trained in the south of Scotland in different things, in different ways. Because that, yes, that was from listening to what the people, as we went round and talked to the 600-odd people we did, about what they saw was the thing that they wanted to do most in the south of Scotland, and that was keep our young people. And one of the ways you keep your young people is by having them trained in, in different things here. And therefore, whoever runs it has to have, and we, it was part of what was discussed at the, the, the previous session, we want that, that whoever the board is, we'll have to have tentacles, groups, however we want to do it, out into the business community, into the community community, into all the population, just to see that how it does. So in many ways, my answer to that question is it has to be the people of the south of Scotland, because if in the end they don't like the south of Scotland Development Agency, then it shouldn't be sitting in place in the first place. Yeah, can I say I totally agree with you uh, in regard to that? Can I move on to my next question? The committee has heard that the new agency will not be given certain of the specific powers which both SE and HIE have, such as the powers of compulsory purchase or information requests. Do the panel members think or, and agree that the new agency should have the same powers in these regards as Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, or even do you think it should have more powers? I'm, I'm going to take one answer, if I may, from uh, each of the councils and, 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 and Russell or Rob. So who'd like to head off on, on that one? Brian, do you want to go with that? Thank you, convener. I, 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 this, this is something we've closely considered, uh, and actually we, we don't think that there are um, uh, broad missing powers. I, I think compulsory purchase powers are a classic example where uh, actually through that partnership work with local, local authorities uh, you, you, and, and building on that strong partnership that would be in place, the, the powers that are currently vested with local authorities could be used for any, any rare instance of compulsory purchase. Uh, so so I, I think by working in close partnership, uh, there don't need to be uh, additional powers. Um, Elaine, do you, do you want to come back? I mean, HIE yeah, have I, never used the powers. I, I'm not them. hugely exercised about whether or not the new agency has powers of compulsory purchase or can compel people under criminal... Uh, 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 well, it could be a criminal offence if they don't give uh, information or whatever. I'm not. I don't actually think those are sort of absolutely crucial to the to the working of the new agency. But I would say on the issue of accountability, I think 
There could be a case made for councillors being on the board with a parallel with uh, health boards and so on. But I think maybe what I'm more concerned about is how people are held to account in the local communities. And I would like actually to see reports on the action plans coming back as they do from Police Scotland and Fire and Rescue Service coming back to the local authorities or indeed to the area committees of the local authorities so that people can actually see in Wigtonshire or wherever, how is this working for me? How is this working in my community? Mike Rumbles, you want to come in and then we're going to move on to Colin. I, mean, I wanted to just follow up with a question. First question that Richard posed and that was, he was talking about, he asked about managing or the very high expectations that people have about this bill. And in this bill, it's a bit like the Islands Bill that the committee looked at before. This is an enabling bill. It's setting up an agency. But nowhere does it discuss resources, uh, money. Um, what a, I, mean, is there an ex I think from what I just heard the previous meeting that there are expectations out there that this is going to be, um, the expectations are very high. Um, has there, nobody got any comments to make so far about the lack of resources being mentioned here? Um, the ministers are, are looking, in, at least initially, to um, direct parity with, but on a per capita basis, with with the budget of Highlands and Islands. A reduction in Scottish Enterprise budget. Do you think? I, 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 I think some of some of the some of the discussion um, that, you, that you've had in previous sessions and in and in the session this afternoon was was that um, perhaps there hadn't been quite as much Scottish enterprise um, act activity in the south as, as, as a lot of, a lot of people would would like I, I wouldn't expect um, their budget to be cut because this because this this agency is is uh, being being created this agency is about hold is, is about a reg at a regional level holding those national agencies to a, to account I just think sorry I just I'd quite like to bring in uh, John Mason on that, uh, on the thing, and, and I know Gavin wants to answer, and, and I think Russell wants to come in, so uh, try and spread it out a bit. Thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, it was on the financial side, and, and to be devil's advocate slightly, um, d can you really justify the same funding as HIE get? HIE is an incredibly big area with umpteen islands, which, which cause them huge challenges. Uh, surely your challenges aren't as great as that. Capita, though, isn't it? It's not the same funding as high. It's the same per capita yes. funding as high. And we do have, rem we may not have islands, but we have some extremely remote communities in, in both uh, the south of Sc uh, the Vries and Galloway and the Scottish borders. OK. Uh, Mike, have you, have you got... I would like to pursue this because the, the, the witnesses seem to me to be engaging in the same very high expectations, and maybe that's a good thing, that we have high expectations. I am worried personally, it's the same uh, as we took the Islands Bill through this, and we went to Orkney Island and, and, and to Mull, and people there were equally expectant that when we passed the Islands Bill, island proofing, that magically things would immediately change and get, everybody would get better. But the resources aren't in that act now Resources on, on here. I, I, I find it strange that you believe that there's an awful lot of extra money going to come in here somewhere. That the Scottish Enterprise budget isn't going to be cut, uh, and is, is it not therefore the same money? I'm, I'm going to bring in Gavin, and then I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to move on to the next question, just purely because we're time limited. Gavin. Uh, we have entered this in good faith for the last 10 years, and what we're looking for is additional funding. It must be additional to what we currently get. So therefore, it's not about a, a smaller cake. It's about a larger cake. And that would be a matter for the minister to in his bill. And we will, hold, we will hold the minister to account locally. The second, it's got to be sustained. The, the, what was suffered from, and if you look at, I mean, Highlands and Islands wasn't a success overnight. There's sustained investment, been able to make those long-term plans. And there's also the recognition that from day one, an agency couldn't spend the whole budget given the vagaries of government accounting. But it's that commitment that this must be a larger cake than we currently have, and that's what we're asking for. Uh, Russell, you're, you're, you're nodding. Okay. 
Thank goodness I'm not going to fall out with you over, over not bringing you in. Colin, yours is the next question. Th thanks very much, Convener. Can I return to the, the issue of, um, of local accountability? Rob, you mentioned it was important that the, the new agency is accountable to the south of Scotland. And Russell, you said, um, frankly, that the, uh, if the people of the south of Scotland don't like the agency, it, it shouldn't exist. But I've got the bill here uh, uh, under the section on accountability. There's absolutely no mention whatsoever of any local accountability. So how, how should the agency be held to account because there's no mechanism in the bill to allow that to happen. Goodwill's fine, but that may not always be there. So how can it be held to account locally? What the bill does say, if I can quote it, is that ministers will appoint all the members. It states the agency must comply with any direction issued by Scottish ministers. It says the agency's action plan can be changed by ministers, which, unlike the Highlands and Islands, um, there's no legal requirement to consult the agency before they make those changes. So there's lots of accountability to ministers, but there's nothing at all in the bill about accountability to the most important people in this, which is those that live in the south of Scotland. Rob. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, I think um, Councillor Murray's touched on this earlier, but um, my description of how we address this challenge, and it's an absolutely legitimate and important challenge, is to try and um, describe what I see as, as almost a triple lock. So there is the ministerial accountability for the organisation. There has to be, as uh, Councillor Rowling and Councillor Murray said earlier, an accountability to local elected members. And I think the evolution of the South of Scotland Alliance to allow that to happen into something that looks similar to Convention of Islands and Islands will be very successful. Um, it will take some time to develop, but I think that will work. My understanding is that the new agency will be a statutory partner in the Community Planning Partnership. And as Councillor Murray said, I would expect and I would anticipate that it's absolutely foursquare uh, a, um, a prerequisite of the uh, agency that it reports on an area by area basis to whatever area arrangements each council has. Um, and I think that's area committees with, uh, within each council area or local area partnerships that we have in the Scottish Borders area. In other words, the agency should be visible to those people who will make the judgment that, that Russell identified, whether that's senior councillors through a convention model or whether it's um, local ward councillors and, and local community interests through a local area partnership discussion or to the minister, that triple lock, I think, is what gives you the accountability across the whole range of needs. So if, if I can come in with a question, uh, which is if there is to be a plan, uh, a 10-year plan was suggested at the previous meeting as, as a reasonable time frame. Do you think the Parliament should have a scrutiny uh, or oversight of that plan, or do you think it's sufficient for it to be done at local level? I would expect the agency to have to plan in a similar way to Scottish Enterprise and High, and my understanding is that planning process works pretty well and with local development, local discussion, a board um, agreeing the plan. Um, I, I would think it beyond comprehension that the plan arrives with a minister having not been consulted on publicly and not been consulted on with local stakeholders. I can't foresee that that would happen. And at that point, um, the minister is accountable for it and the minister, I, I would expect, um, and indeed the chair and chief executive of that agency could be sat here in uh, years to come while you have a look at that plan and what's been delivered in the previous year. Thank you. Colin. I, I mean, I, I've heard the phrase triple lock, but... The bill is very clear. This agency is accountable to government ministers who can change the action plan without even consulting the agency, never mind the local council or other stakeholders having a say in this. So where is the lock in the legislation? Do we need something to underpin what you're saying? Because actually there's nothing at all in the legislation to make sure that what you say you want to happen will actually happen. There is no accountability locally within, within the bill itself as it currently stands. And I, I, maybe other panel members have got views on how we can have local accountability, but I'm just, you know, we can have lots of ideas, but unless it's underpinned by legislation, then, you know, we're, we're kind of just wishing it happened rather than making it happen. Rob, briefly. Very, very briefly. I, I genuinely think that's a, a question for the Cabinet Secretary to answer. Um, but I've set out how I think you can make arrangements locally which should satisfy the needs of local populations, communities, and also um, uh, local elected members. Lane. I don't think that the Minister should be issuing directions without consultation. I think uh, I understand that's in the high legislation that it, uh, ministers consult, and I think the same respect ought to be shown to the uh, board of the new agency. I think it might well be worth considering whether 
there should be something on the face of the bill as well to to uh, include local accountability because I think it is an omission at the current time. Colin. Just on the issue just of engagement then, uh, looking at it from another point of view of actually involving um, the community in the decisions of, of the board. There's been a lot of discussion about the importance of young people and the demographic challenge we face. Um, do you think there's sufficient in the bill to make sure that key stakeholders like young people in the region um, are, are consulted by the new agency? Who'd like to answer that? Russell. I think it goes back to the point Stuart was making earlier, and I think Mike did this as an enabling bill. So I think there's enough in there. And given all the conversations that we've had, in fact, Rob and I are off to visit every high school in the area over the next six months to make sure that young people do have a say in this. How we then do that as the board comes in, I think that is back to the enabling you do as a result of this. So I think there's plenty in there. Because if you put in young people, you start to get into who else should you put in there. So I think, Colin, I'm content that there's enough in the bill and from all that we've heard from everybody else to say that if we didn't have young people at the centre of what it is we were going to try and do, not just through the partnership but the agency following, we shouldn't be probably doing what we're doing. OK. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, but we have run out of time. And I know I've upset two members on this committee because I can't bring them in, but I'm afraid our time is up because we have another panel to do. So I'd like to thank those people who've come and given evidence. I think there was a question before, Russell, whether you'd be made to squirm during the committee meeting by somebody uh, who I overheard say that. I don't think so, but your evidence has been very useful, all of your evidence. Thank you very much for attending. And I'm now briefly spending the meeting and ask committee members to stay in their seats while we change the panel. Thank you. Uh, to the second evidence session this evening with panel two. I'd like to thank uh, all of you for coming. Uh, introduce you all first, I suppose, Pip Table, Partnership Manager for Southern Uplands Partnership, Ian Cook, Director of Development Trust Association Scotland, Dr. Callum McLeod, Policy Director, Community Land Scotland, uh, Neil, no, I'm going to get this wrong, McQuiston, is that right? Perfect, thank goodness for that. Board member of New Lewis Community Trust, Barbara Elbon, the Secretary of Newcastleton and District Community Trust, and Lorna Young, the consultant of Indigo Woods. Uh, you will have seen, I think, uh, some of the previous session. You don't need to push 
your buttons on your speakers. They will be activated for you. And if you want to say something, could you try and catch my eye and I'll bring you in. We are quite tight for time, so um, short answers will hopefully follow short questions. And the first question is, is it the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross? Um, no, I thought it was no. Unless you want me to go. I'll go for it. Um, we, <laughs> apologies, thank you all for Sorry, keeping I've me right. I've now wrong for the <laughs> Deputy Convener, but it is the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Gail. Thank you. Good evening, panel. We've heard a lot during all our evidence sessions, the session this afternoon and the session just before, about the major challenges facing the South. But we've also heard about all your assets and your strengths. So what do you think that the major strengths and assets that we can build on are and what the major challenges that this bill can address in the agency? Who'd like to head off on that? Callum. And, and thanks indeed to the committee for the opportunity to, to give evidence at this really important session for a really important bill. Um, there are, of course, challenges. Demography is one of them, and, and I'm sure you've heard much about that already. One of the very interesting assets that you have in the, uh, the south of Scotland, which is mentioned in the policy memorandum, but which has not, to my recollection, had that much discussion within some of the, the evidence sessions, perhaps you'll correct me if I'm wrong, is around land itself and land as an asset for the south of Scotland. Uh, and really it's, it's, it's clearly integral and important that the, the south of Scotland builds on that and has opportunities to make the most of uh, the land that's there for economic development and the social aspects that tie into uh, the remit of this agency as well. And within that context, the Committee on Scotland would, and you perhaps expect us to say this, would suggest that building on that is, is in terms of what the, the agency does, what, the, what um, the enterprise agency does is very much around support for community land ownership and community asset ownership as well and how that might actually be um, implemented and undertaken in practice within the, the ambit of the agency. Now, Highlands Lands Enterprise has a very clear uh, remit within that context. It has a community assets team. It's had that since 1997. Community Land Scotland argues very strongly that the new agency should have that type of resource also within its structure to build upon what is identified as a very important asset for the area. Does anyone else want to uh, talk about assets? Uh, Barbara, you want Thank to come you. in and then I'll come to Ian. Thank you. Um, I would like to say um, that Newcastle has uh, recently taken and established its own uh, community assets and as a result of ownership um, that has engendered the community to drive things forward. So I can wholeheartedly agree with what's just been said. But I would also like to add that it, your, uh, the first question is about what's the um, strengths of the South, and I would actually say it's people-based. Um, without the strength of the people and the communities that are the backbone that make up the whole of the South, then there isn't any strengths, really, ultimately. It is understanding and giving the people the opportunity to share their wisdom and knowledge of, of their own and, and determine their own needs uh, and working with the public sector um, that will give it the strength that it needs. Ian, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I mean, I think the um, challenges have been quite well articulated in the previous session and previous sessions. Um, I, again, I would just like to build on what's been said in terms of the strengths. I mean, I think when you look at not just uh, the borders and, and uh, the prison gallery, but the whole of Scotland, one of the Scottish success stories is what's happening in terms of community-led development, community-led regeneration. And there's a lot of that happening already, um, even before the agency set up, and it was really he good to hear Professor Griggs talking about that. Um, the, I mean, the, the vision for the agency is a fresh approach, and I mean, I, my question is, where is that going to come from? And I think the answer to that very much lies in these communities that are shown amazing enterprise, creativity, innovation, addressing market failure. So I think that's, the, for me, the key strength. Thank you. Um, there have been uh, a lot of comparisons with HIE, especially in the area of the Highlands and Islands as a whole, but we've also heard that there are a, a lot of differences as well. And there will be differences in the way that the enterprise agency works. And we've just had a really good report um, which was commissioned by HIE about young people that want to remain in the Highlands and it's gone up significantly. Um, why do you think so many people leave this area? 
And what will the new enterprise agency bring that will enable them or encourage them to stay? Okay, Pip, do you want to go on? I'd just, I'd say the Sudden Optics Partnership, which I manage, has been lobbying for something like this new agency for about 20 years, because we've looked with, with huge envy about what's been going on in, in the north, where we see communities have been supported to develop all sorts of new enterprises, whether that's based on land or renewable energy or whatever. I think the new agency is, is going to have to spend quite a lot of time and energy catching up, but we have the same assets, we have the same potential in this part of the world. If we can nurture that <coughs> by working with communities that are already there doing some exciting things, fully agree there's some, there's some really good examples of good practice in this part of the world, but we've also got a lot of communities that, that are starting from a very low baseline and there's a lot of catching up to be done, so I'm really hoping the agency can start to work with some of the high capacity communities, but also nurture some of the lower capacity communities. And I think if, if it does that effectively, young people will want to stay because they'll start to see there are huge opportunities in this part of the world that they can take advantage of. The reason I think they've been leaving in recent years is because those opportunities just haven't been visible. Um, uh, Barbara, you wanted to come in and then I'll bring you, you in, Lorna. Thank you. Um, I think as far as we're concerned, we are miles, hours away from accessing education and to get our young people to actually attain to colleges or stay on for further education is a challenge. Um, it already takes an hour to get them to senior school and it takes two hours to get them to a college. So having an outreach education program as part of this new initiative is absolutely fundamental to keeping young people in the catchment area. Um, I don't know how it's going to manifest itself but um, being able to do local apprenticeships without having to send um, young people to college will make a massive difference. Um, Lorna, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I, I, in the longer term, I don't think it's about keeping our young people necessarily because people will naturally want to, want to experience um, living elsewhere. I myself left the region, came back when, when I was in my mid-twenties. Um, it's, it's about more having a more balanced demographic. I think one of the reasons why young people want to move away is to experience other places, other cultures, to develop skills that, that are maybe more easily developed in an urban area rather than a rural area. But then providing these opportunities for people who want to come back, perhaps to start a family, perhaps to experience the, the high quality of life we've got here. It's about understanding kind of the, the broader offering that we have for people at every demographic stage. Okay. Michael earlier on about um, consulting with young people and I think that one of the um, challenges that legislators have had in the past is as we said before top-down legislation rather than bottom-up. How do we make sure, um, I know that Russell uh, said that he's going to go into every high school now and, and speak to the young people in there which is fantastic but how do we engage more with these young people to make sure that we're actually doing stuff that is going to benefit them and the things that they want us to do, not what, what we think we should be doing for them? Who'd like to come back? Uh, Neil, and, and, and then Ian, and, and we'll see where we go from there, Neil. <coughs> well, I, I would just say that I, I have some first-hand personal experience of young people who want to leave the area. In fact, I encouraged my children to, to go and, and uh, see the rest of the world. And I really do want to make the south of Scotland here a place that they want to come back to someday when they gather up all their experiences all over the world. I want them to actually want to come back here. And, and I think we do have the, we have a lot of unreleased potential in the south of Scotland that I think wouldn't be very difficult to realize with just a little bit of imagination. And I like the idea of what uh, Russell was talking about, about his idea of community and this feeling of pride in our community, pride in our area, and you know, just making this a very attractive place. As far as how do we engage with these young people is concerned this, I think all too often that when we go to engage with people and to consult with them, we, we spend far too much time talking and we don't spend enough time listening. I think there's not enough listening going on all around. And although I think uh, the South of Scotland Economic Partnership has done its very best to get everybody's attention and get everybody talking, I think we really need to go round again because I think we've only fired a volley here. We've fired a warning shot. We've got people's attention. Now's the time to start listening, I think. Hey, Ian. 
Yeah, just to pick up the, um, the engagement theme, I think there's some great examples already in the South of how you engage communities and, and, and whether that's young people or whether that's the adult population. Uh, and we're in Dumfries and I think the Stove Network have got a, a fantastic sort of track record of doing that. Um, and that, that kind of use of kind of creativity, arts activities is a really successful way to do that. I think one of the key lessons that's often missed from the high experience was particularly in the early years, there was a great emphasis on, on cultural development. And I think that kind of cultural resistance which took place provided the backbone, gave a sort of stronger sense of place to young people. And they have come back and they, ha they have got a stronger affinity with place. So I agree with what's been said, but I would add that to the, to the evidence. Finlay, you wanted to ask a follow-up on that. Th thanks, Kim. It's just going back to, to a statement that, that Callum made. Um, I was just wondering where the barriers are relating to community land assets in, in the south of Scotland, where we've had some fantastic examples of the, the Muller Galloway Trust, whatever. Um, so, so where are the barriers at the moment, and what legislation within the new agency would, would overcome those barriers? Some of the barriers are... Yeah. Um, cultural to a degree uh, in, in terms of uh, where communities see the opportunities uh, to actually uh, engage in, in, in purchasing land or assets itself. And it's traditionally, historically, of course, community land ownership, land reform in general, but certainly community land ownership has been portrayed as a kind of Northwest Highland issue and a rural issue. Uh, well, if we've learned anything over the last four or five years, it's the case that it's very much not that. It's for something for all of, all of Scotland, rural and urban. We've got a situation here in, in, uh, at the moment in Scotland where we've got 562,000, give or take, acres in community land ownership um, in, 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 in Scotland. The vast majority of that is actually where I come from, the Western Isles, and, 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 and right with that, the, the broader highlands and islands. We've got 794 acres of land and community ownership in Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish borders combined. So one of the main barriers I would suggest and Community Land Scotland would argue is, is, is partly around culture and thinking where the opportunities might lie. And as you've said, Mr. Carson, there are some fantastic examples of where that's happened. We need to kind of have that domino effect working uh, throughout the south of Scotland to see and, 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 and engage where, where there are opportunities to do that. And that's why it's, it's critical you, you can have all the, the kind of legislation in terms of community right to buy and Scottish land funds fundamentally important in terms of supporting that. But also what is important as well is having uh, the actual institutional support that can enable communities to actually see where the opportunities are. Now, the Scottish Land Commission has just sent recommendations to Scottish Government around the future of community land ownership and, and uh, aspects around that. And they have recommended very strongly that this new agency in the south of Scotland has, as I said earlier, the equivalent um, remit and role that the uh, community assets team and unit has in Highlands and Isles Enterprise. That will be a critically important aspect in terms of just um, helping to, to, to move that collectively beneficial agenda forward, I would suggest. Just to come in and then we'll get back to Gail Ross for the next question key issues or barriers to community asset ownership is community capacity. It is a, believe me, I've been there, I've done it, and I've run my own business, but actually to be held accountable um, for something that you believe in to the benefit, to, to, to add real strength to your community is a challenge. And to get funders to have confidence in you as a group to support that, the idea and the acquisition and to give you the budget to be able to develop that acquisition is an enormous responsibility. So it's really, really fundamentally important that the new agency has got community capacity in its remit somewhere. Uh, we desperately need support to help those communities drive this forward. We can. Again. Um, thanks for that, and that leads quite nicely on to my next question. Can you give any experiences or perceptions about the current support available from agencies such as Scottish Enterprise or Business Gateway, the Colleges and Skills Development Scotland? Barbara, I'm guessing you might have a view on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I go back to 2004 in my community um, where we have struggled to get an appointment of a development officer, whatever you want to call them. Um, we have worked as individuals 
and as voluntary organisations to drive forward projects and we still don't have a development officer. Um, we have been turned down by public sector agencies because we didn't meet the criteria that was preset. So the opportunity to, to change that criteria through this new agency is absolutely critical. Um, we've been turned down by funders because we didn't meet the right um, agenda, their prescriptive agenda, which is the right agenda for them, for why they're awarding the budget. But I think this is an opportunity to start a new, a new ball game and to give those, the communities the opportunity um, to have that um, support. There seemed to be a lot of nodding there. Is there going to be some good news from someone, uh, Lorna, and then followed by Pip? I think I would um, make two points. First of all, I, I deal with a lot of small businesses and I also work with a lot of community development trusts, so I see kind of both sides. The current provision at the moment is quite um, segmented, so if you fit within the predefined boxes, then, then all is well, but, but most people don't. Um, so that can be quite frustrating when you're trying to access support. I would say the other, the other big issue that we face in South of Scotland is sustainability and the ability to plan for the longer term. So we have a lot of community development trusts here who are on annual funding. So th th they really can't make any long-term plans because they don't know whether or not they'll have an officer in post this time next year. And I think these, are, these, these two aspects are both things that the agency should address as a matter, matter of urgency. <coughs> Just back up Laura's point there, because one of the key problems we have, our experience of working with communities, is that most community development workers, when you, when you can secure one, you, it's project funded, therefore it's time limited, therefore it's one or two years maximum. And, and in our view, if you're serious about growing community capacity, which I think we, we all are serious about, it's a long-term process. It's not something you can do in a, in a limited period of time. And I'm really hoping the new agency will take that long-term approach to community capacity growth, because that's where the future is, I think. Stuart, you wanted to come in. Uh, it's a fairly brief thing. It's just looking at the draft of the bill at 5.2.F, uh, among, in other words, it includes um, what the, the body must do, supporting community organisations to help them meet communities' needs. Is that sufficient in the bill? Because it's a list of things they've got to do, but not telling us how they need to be done, because that's the responsibility of the body itself. Callum. Is no. It's the short answer to that, Mr. Seaman, is, is, is no, it's not sufficient. And uh, we would certainly, um, Committee on Scotland, we, 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 we argue strongly that um, Certainly, the, 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 the support that I mentioned to community organisations with regard to ownership of, of land and assets would be most beneficially included on the face of the bill itself. Uh, because, as you say, they, these are, these are, are, are broad. Well, sorry, may I intervene? Sure, of course. Can you give me some specific words you think should be in the bill? Uh, the enterprise agency should include within its remit, and I can, I'll have to finesse this afterwards, uh, um, a responsibility for supporting uh, community land and asset ownership. That's fine. Thank you. That was um, a, a, a quick answer. Well done. Um, now, I think the next question then comes down to Mike. Mike, it's yours. Um, now, folks, I'm going to ask the um, devil's advocate question. You know, the, the basic question basically is in previous sessions on the committee, we've had evidence from Scottish Enterprise. We've just had evidence from the two local authorities and the South of Scotland Economic Partnership. All four of these organisations have remits within them which are similar to the new one. Similar, not the same, but similar. And they have all their responsibilities already for economic development. So here we are. We're going to create a new body, a fifth body, in statute. And my previous question to the other witnesses was about resources and budgets. So we're now going to spread this between five different organizations rather than just four. Any comment? In other words, why is it important for the south of Scotland to have its own enterprise agency in addition to all of these? Neil, followed by Ian. I, th I think we, have, we need to have a really complete change of culture here. I heard the lofty ambitions of some of the earlier speakers there and, and some of them want to be the best in the world. Some of them want to be the best in Europe. I would just quite like to be the best in Scotland, to be perfectly honest. And I think that that is achievable. 
I, th I think. But it won't be achieved if we do more of the same of what we've been doing already, because that's already been proven that we won't end up the best in Scotland if we keep doing that. So I think if we, I think at the moment there's this perception that, you know, all the heat that's being generated in the south of Scotland is actually in the middle, and we're we're feeling quite cold out at the outside, out in the edges there. And there's great huge potential out in those edges. Where I live out in in the west there, the the Rins Peninsula is practically an island community, but that in itself is a huge asset that could be developed. And I think if the people in Dromore, which is as far west as you can go, if they wake up in two years' time and discover that uh, the South of Scotland Economic uh, Agency is in Dumfries, we have failed. If the people in Eyemouth wake up in two years' time and they discover that the South of Scotland Economic Agency is in St. Boswell's, we've failed. We need to make sure that the whole of the south of Scotland is feeling the heat and, and uh, that way we'll all prosper. The whole of Scotland will, will actually benefit from that, not just the south, but there needs to be a complete change of culture. Yeah, I mean, I would just follow up on that. I'm just going to make a sort of broadly similar point. I mean, I think that if we're being honest about it, a lot of what's happened in Scotland around community-led development, community-led regeneration has happened in spite of Scottish enterprise and in spite of uh, business gateway, etc., with the exception of probably high in the Highlands. So I think what's desperate is, is a need for cultural change in the public sector, right across the public sector. Um, we, we need to change attitudes. We need to get communities taken seriously. We need to get this moving beyond the rhetoric. I've worked in regeneration for 30 odd years now, and communities are always at the heart of the policy documents, but that's seldom translates to the actual kind of reality of what communities face and how, how things work, uh, work out. So that kind of cultural change, that attitudinal change is crucial. And that's why I think there's a key role for the new agency to do that. Okay, I'm gonna bring in uh, Richard. You wanted yeah, to ask supplementary. Uh, I was a local government councillor for 36 years. Can I say I totally agree with you? Uh, the point you've just made, spread the jam. Can I go back to my original qu question? Should councils be, be on the board or have any control of the board? Um, I'm just, uh, I, I see you wanted to come in, Neil. I'm just wondering, but Neil, go for it. No. <laughs> Thank I you. I love short answers. Anyone else got a comment on, to follow up on that? Callum. Um, I, I came in towards the, towards the tail end of the last session. Um, I, I think local accountability is, is, is fundamentally important to this agency. That's one of the reasons that we need a new agency, I think, Mr. Rumbles, as well, to come back to your, your, your point there. Uh, who's involved with that in terms of mm. representation um, needs to be broad in terms of the skills that are there. It should not just be uh, the, the kind of usual suspects in terms of that, and it should certainly include community interest in the broadest sense in that context. Because if we're talking about doing things differently and having a new agency which is going to actually address these economic, social, environmental, and cultural aspects, uh, well, we do need to have that kind of bottom-up grassroots accountability factor or in, in relation to that. Pip, did you, want, did you want to come in on that? Um, no, not particularly. My experience is that <coughs> um, where the council treads, you tend to create suspicion and angst, and therefore, if you don't have to have council members on the board, it might be better if they weren't. I think, I think I'm going to park that one there without taking that any further. Uh, Jamie, do you want to lead on the next question? Uh, uh, thanks, Camino. And I'll, I'll keep it very brief because we're short on time this evening. Um, some of the people in this room have been campaigning for an agency like this for, well, decades. Um, as it stands, does the bill deliver what you've been asking for? And if it doesn't, is that because you haven't been properly consulted in this process? In other words, could it be better? If you'd like to, uh, Pip. Go on from that. Um, I don't think it does fully satisfy us as yet. Um, we were very happy to work with Rob Dixon and with Russell Griggs on the community consultation, which they ran across southern Scotland. I think the messages coming through that consultation exercise were very loud and clear. People wanted to be engaged. They wanted a new agency. They wanted it to reflect the culture and heritage values of southern Scotland. There was a huge amount of excitement and positivity there. Strong calls for clear accountability. I think everybody wanted this new organization to be as transparent and as close to the people as possible. 
and I think the, the need to, to address community issues came through extremely loudly. And my concern with the bill as it stands is the community component of it is very weak and the environmental bit of it is also rather weak. And I'd like to see both those parts strengthened. And that's what we put in our written submission. Quite a lot of nodding there from the panel. Does anyone want to add anything on top of that? Barbara, do you want Thank to? Thank you. Um, yeah, I would concur with what's been said, but I would also add, and I think it was mentioned in the previous session, about um, having arms and legs uh, in order to be able to influence infrastructure decisions. New Castledon and many other communities in the south of Scotland, we describe ourselves as a landlocked island. Um, and uh, in terms of accessibility and these sorts of things and deliverables, um, we have insurmountable challenges and we must have the agency must be able to work with others um, in a streamlined process so that there is joined upness amongst all the public sector agencies uh, we cannot continue to battle as individual communities and fight every single war um, and it does feel like that sometimes okay um, thank you maureen i think yours is the next question thank you convener and good evening uh, panel uh, just to follow on uh, what Barbara said, I think you and perhaps some others in your written evidence said uh, that the bill lacks powers to influence things like infrastructure, like connectivity, transport, you'd add housing into that mix as well. Um, can I have the views of the rest of the panel uh, on that? And why do you think the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency would make a difference in that area? Yeah. Given that the powers probably lie at currently with some other body. I mean, the last panel said uh, just to, that, that connectivity didn't need to be uh, broadband connectivity because it was all going to be solved shortly. Um, there's a few shaking heads. Perhaps that would help, help you answer, Maureen. Does, who'd like to go on Maureen's question? Callum, would you like to? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Kinville. Um, clearly, the agency has uh, an important role, as other panel members have, have mentioned, in relation to connecting up and helping to connect up different um, elements with, the, with regard to development. But I think, the, y yes, a laudable ambition to think that digital connectivity will be sorted out imminently. Um, I'm not sure that's the case. Uh, I think it needs to, it's, it's pretty fundamental in relation to uh, going back to the very earliest point about people being the most important resource and, and, and making sure that people actually are, are retained and population maintained in the area, it's in, in, in the region itself. So, so that's fundamentally important. But the agency as well has, has uh, I think an important partnership role to play in, in, in terms of connecting up with, with other areas of development too, whether that's around housing, whether that's around obviously job um, opportunities and other kind of cultural and social opportunities as well, which are actually going to play and to the strengths of, of the region itself in terms of its asset base. So in that sense, it's, it's got a very important role to play, I think. Uh, Ian. You know, communities looking at how they move forward, how they address quality of life issues, take a holistic view to their place. And it's about place. And I think that was kind of touched on in the last session. We, we almost got there. This is more than just economics. So I think a key challenge for the, um, the new agency will be what can do beyond the, the narrower economic remit. Because if you're talking about young people, unless there are more affordable housing, young people will not come back or, or, will, or will leave if they tend to leave the, the south of Scotland. So I think it's that ability to kind of have a wider vision and look at how the economics sits within the creation of good quality places where people want to work and live. Sorry, Callum, do you want to? Yeah, point in relation to what, what Ian said there, because I think it's really, really important, that, that idea of placemaking and what the assets are in a place which are going to uh, make it attractive and ultimately sustainable as well. Now, one of the things that... Uh, Community Land Scotland's been engaged in over the last, gosh, 18 months or so is, is around, we're calling it kind of people's legitimate place in the landscape. And what we're really talking about there is just what is it around, about rural areas and often sparsely populated rural areas of which there are, of course, in the southern uplands here, um, areas of, of that, that nature as well. What is it that's going to actually um, improve the prospects of rural repopulation? In, in areas like that. And, and it very much does have to be around place making and it very much does have to be around having the conditions in place and the infrastructure in place and the opportunities 
jobs and, and, and for, for more, br more broadly for, for well-being of, of communities to actually uh, experience that in their everyday lives. And clearly the agency has not the exclusive remit, but an important part to play at that local level in terms of doing that, that regional level. I think. I'd like to bring in Neil and then Lorna, if I may. Neil. <coughs> I, I would just like to say that the, you know, the agency, I don't think it needs to be loaded up with superpowers here because you have already mentioned that this is like a 10 year plan. It is going to be a marathon. It's not going to be a sprint. So as long as, as long as it's, as long as the agency uh, delivers it, it gets you off to a good start and creates a, a, a good environment to work in. Uh, I don't think it needs to be top heavy with, with powers and things like that. It'll work, uh, but it's not going to work overnight. Lorna, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I think, I think one of the key things that's important to, to be aware that the South of Scotland agency is going to be transformative because we're going to have a public body that's going to put South of Scotland first. And that in itself is, is new and different and will change how, how um, other public agencies are influenced. It's going to act as a conduit or a linkage between the South and, and, and the rest of Scotland. Um, and uh, uh, the, the other point I wanted to make was in terms of rural development generally, I think where it works well is where it's understood as, as, a, as, a, as an ecosystem in itself. So where um, support traditionally is again segmented through um, different agencies with a, a sectoral focus. I think the South Scotland Agency is going to be looking at the South as an ecosystem in itself, an economic ecosystem, a, a, a network of communities. And that systems approach, I think, again, is, is new and different and, and fairly radical. Um, and, so, and, and that gets back to one of the key things that was raised earlier, it's how things are done going forward perhaps rather is going to be more important than maybe what's done. Maureen. Um, an idea that um, in a previous evidence session when um, there was a kind of comparison with Highlands and Islands Enterprise and there are probably more social enterprises in the Highlands than Islands because of a different land ownership um, system in many parts of the Highlands. I wonder um, whether you think that current land ownership is perhaps a bit of um, a, a break on, on development and economic growth uh, in, in the in south of Scotland and whether there are opportunities for more community land ownership and therefore social enterprises and, and therefore um, a bit of growth in the economy. Um, Callum, I'll start with you. I wasn't, yeah, well, thank you very much indeed, Camille. Thank you very much for, for, for that question. I, I, I was reading the, the previous um, evidence sessions with this, and I, I, I noticed you, you, you asked that same question to uh, Douglas Cowan of Highlands Islands Enterprise. And I was interested in one of the points that he made in response to that, which was around um, applications to the Scottish Land Fund. Uh, and he, he said that Dumfries and Galloway was, I think, third in the list of, of local authorities which were actually putting applications in. In, in relation to the fund itself and, and support. So that, to my mind, um, opens up, or is indicative, if you like, of, of interest within the south of Scotland, in Dumfries and Galloway at least, in relation to the possibilities of community land ownership as a mechanism for the sustainability and placemaking uh, of communities themselves. Now that's important because you'll hear different arguments about the place or otherwise of community land ownership in terms of development. Uh, some will argue that it doesn't matter who owns the land, it's how it's used that counts. And to be sure, of course, it is important, clearly, as to how land is used. But ownership actually gives you some uh, element of control and enables you as a community to uh, sort of shape your own destiny to, 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 to a large extent because you're able to think about the choices that might be made in order to make places more, more coherent and more, more, more um, suitable to, to, to the communities that live in them in terms of what their aspirations are. And I, I mentioned it right at the very start of the session that the, the glaring disparity in relation to the level of, of community land ownership in the Highlands and Islands and the south of Scotland, 794 acres combined in, in, in Dumfries and Galloway and, and Borders is not indicative of uh, a kind of flow towards moving towards community ownership. So there are opportunities that this agency can help to address in that sense. Thank you, Callum. I'm, I'm sorry to be... Uh, 
the one to cut people short, but we, we still have questions, so short answers will allow me to get through all the questions, which will then keep the committee members talking to me. So um, I think, Ian, you wanted to come in with, 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 a, with a short answer. Just briefly, I mean, I think that um, economic development, regeneration, as you say, it does require the efficient recycling of land, um, and land in the legal sense, so land and property. Um, so whether it's an empty shop in a high street or a, or a, or a, or a, or a gap site or whatever, um, it's, it's how it's done. And it's getting property from the hands of people who aren't doing anything with it into the hands of people who are going to do something constructive with it, whether that be communities, the public sector or whatever. So I think that's quite crucial. It's a key, key task for the new agency. Okay. Yep. Okay, good. Um, Pip, I think it was your organisation uh, had the view that uh, improving the amenity and environment of South of Scotland needs further interpretation in the bill. Could you expand on that a little, please? Yes, indeed. I, I think our, our concern was that that wording is a little bit passive. Uh, slightly suggests that the land is there, nature is there to be, to be capitalised upon. And to some extent, that's absolutely fine, because we want to see Southern Scotland making more of the assets that it has access to. But equally, we think it's really important that it's capitalised on the ways which aren't going to damage it. And therefore, I think our feeling was that we should be a bit more specific about how we value the environment that we have and the natural and cultural assets as well. Use them by all means and use them as creatively and innovatively as we possibly can, but do it in a way that's not going to harm them. And I think just being explicit about that would be quite valuable. I think, I okay, think, then, okay, I just think just Maureen, I'm afraid we are going to Can I just say finally, and you didn't let me in on, no, the, Maureen, on the last bit, so can I just ask? Maureen, um, with the greatest yeah, respect, I, I'm sorry, I, I've got four more questionnaires to do, and I've got four minutes. Know. So I am going to have to move on, and I'm really sorry, I apologise. Colin, y yours is the next question. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Can, can I just uh, ask the panel if they have any thoughts or, or views on how we can ensure local accountability of the new agency uh, and specifically how, how do we ensure that the board um, reflects the south of Scotland so that we have for example uh, people with experience in small business, family run enterprises, the third sector, trade unions, young people uh, and other community groups. How do we make sure that they are on the board if you like of the new agency um, is that something that should be specified in the bill for example? Would, would two of you like to, to offer to speak? Pip, you were nodding furiously. Would you yeah. like, sorry, I beg your pardon if I was. Um, <laughs> I, I agree completely. I think all those are really important audiences for the agency, and therefore we need to find a mechanism for engaging with them and, and being accountable to them. How you do that, I'm afraid I haven't got a magic solution. It's a huge task. It's a big geographic area. It's a very broad audience. It's going to be a very broad agenda that the agency is delivering on. It's going to be a hard task. But I think the, the agency... The, the partnership has started very well by going out on the road and speaking to communities across southern Scotland. I think that was an excellent way of starting. And perhaps just repeating that on a regular basis would be one way of doing that, listening to what people are saying. Somebody's already said how important it is that we listen. I think that, that's a message that, that the agency needs to take on board. Do you very shortly and then Barbara, very briefly. Uh, very, very shortly. Um, it, it's critically important that the, the agency has local accountability uh, for the communities themselves. I don't have an obvious answer to that, but it must not be lost sight of in terms of the, the bill. Barbara. I think it's really important that the board is made up of the right calibre of people to do the job. So it's got to be skills based first and by definition, because it's, it's got to be an inclusive board to deliver the job that it's got to do um, in the marketplace that it's doing it, it will include um, representation from uh, communities and social enterprise companies and, and so forth. By definition, it must. <laughs> um, in, in all seriousness, and I'll, I'll, I know we're running out of time, so I'll keep this tight. How would you uh, ensure that the South of Scotland economy benefits from the employment opportunities and procurement opportunities the new agency could bring to this region? It's You've all just been elected, so tell me. I mean, uh, Ian and then Barbara, I think you were almost offering. Yeah. Ian. I, th I think proc procurement is, is a huge frustration for communities because for the last seven, eight years within the Scottish Government, we've been talking about creating opportunities for communities. Communities want to run local services, create local jobs, etc. And I don't understand the, the, the detail of, or, or the barriers 
um, part of it's blamed on the EU and, and, and procurement directives, etc. I, I don't quite understand that, but we've got to, to do that. We've got to push contracts and tenders and down to lo the lowest possible kind of community levels. If we don't do that, the same companies will come in and mop up and we don't keep the money within local communities. We've got to build local economies and I think procurement's key to that. Yeah, thank you. Um, again, speaking from experience, we've had to uh, go to public procurement and it's added hundreds of thousands of pounds to projects uh, that we could have administrated ourselves locally for better. We understand the need to be accountable to the public purse, but again, I think that there is a new way that we could look at doing that to ensure that procurement is done within the, within the catchment area. Okay, R Richard, do, do you? They're all employed, Chairman, <laughs> uh, convener, thank you. Okay, uh, and, and the final question is normally mine, but I'm afraid we've run out of time. Uh, purely because, not because we don't want to hear more evidence from you, it's just purely a logistic thing of getting people back to Edinburgh and, and trains on, and connectivity. So I'd like to thank you all for, for giving evidence to the committee. I would also uh, say that it's been hugely informative, so thank you for your time. I think at the last meeting I made an offer that uh, if anyone wanted to, if I'd missed anything and you'd felt rushed, that you could actually submit uh, to the clerks by the end of this week on the email that you've got to this, anything that you think that we may have missed. I would ask you to remain seated while I move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the consideration of two consent notifications in relation to UK SIs as detailed on our agenda. These cover, uh, committee, the important trade of animals and animal products and animals and food. All the instruments being laid in the UK Parliament are in relation to the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. Both SIs being categorised as Category B, B to the extent that the transition from an EU to a UK framework would be a major and significant development. Uh, committee members, you've had a chance to look at the SIs. Are there any comments that you'd like to make? I'll take Stuart first, followed by uh, John. Stuart. Uh, just to agree with uh, the recommendation that there is in the note that's before us, that we should ask in both cases that we be kept up to date by the government. In one case, the replacement of the traces system and the other, the system identification and registration of various animal health related issues. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, John. Thank you. I, um, I agree with Stuart on that point. I think it would be helpful to, to be kept up to date. Uh, I, I also think. Um, like to comment on the, the letter from the Minister of 3rd January and as I did in the previous session draw attention to the fact that whilst this is satisfactory it's a very poor substitute for remaining a, in the European Union and I think it's important that that's on the record. Um, right, okay, well what I, what I think we've agreed then as a committee uh, that we've agreed to write to the Scottish Government to confirm we are content for the consent of the UK SIs referred to in the notifications and note a request for a response from the Scottish Government on the wider policy matters identified. Are we agreed? We are agreed. That concludes today's committee uh, business and thank you committee members and thank you to all the people in Dumfries and uh, the Borders in Galloway for, for hosting us today. It's extremely kind of you and we very much enjoyed being out of Edinburgh. Thank you very much and I now conclude the meeting.